Hi everyone, today we're talking about Weesh. I'm Valerie and I'm here with Linda from Color Storms Yarn. And we have reached the namesake chapter. So we're talking about the chapter titled Weesh. Linda, what did you think? Oh, I was really glad to finally learn the meaning of the word. <laughs> um, I was very particular when I started reading the book and, and us doing this book club, I wanted to make sure I pronounced it correctly. Um, so I even um, went to Kate Davies website herself and contacted one of the people there and made sure I uh, pronounced it correctly, but I never <laughs> learned the meaning of it. <laughs> now I know it means wheel and, and she talks about the idea of silence and apparently in Scotland there's a saying to hod jerished and I don't actually know what that whole thing means but it sounds like hold on to your wheel to me that's what it sounds like because in the very center of the wheel is a space and I never thought about a wheel as representing a space, a silence. I think a wheel is being something productive. It means we go places. But my husband did used to have a wagon wheel and we displayed it in our front yard like many Western families. And I wish I had it now. It's like a hurricane. The eye of a hurricane, you know, is quiet. So the center of a wheel is also representative of silence. That's new for me. I'm thinking back, um, I think it was last year I did, I think it was an eight week study on the labyrinth and what a labyrinth is. It's the circle maze that a lot of, um, you walk it, you can walk it in a garden or you can trace it with your finger and it goes around the exterior and then you twist and turn and then you get to the middle and then there's a whole journey back out. And so that's coming up for me. Mm. Mm. Is it generally a, a journey you, you take alone? Um, it's used as a tool in meditation and contemplation and there's a whole network of physical labyrinths around the country and around the world. And it's found, you know, there's labyrinths in the United Kingdom and in ancient China, like it's very common across the, the globe. Is there a, is it special to be a circle labyrinth or can it be a rectangular or square? As I understand it, it can be any shape, but the most common shape is a circle. Okay. Yeah, that's very similar, I think, to that concept of a journey in silence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just read this little bit here. Um, surely there are times when creativity could be much more about silence than self-expression, Kate Davis mm. writes. And when a hushed detachment might be more important than the loudly self-affirming act. Why should we feel that we have to say something very loudly just to make a difference, to make our mark upon the world? Our world is already very noisy. Perhaps it is the moments when we feel pressured to raise our own creative voices in order to be heard. We might learn something useful from stillness or silence. Mm -hmm. So for me, I watch a lot of, I watch a lot of media about the creative process. So people who invent toys and people who design clothes and like all of the creative expression. And it's a very common theme 
for someone who has a very colorful, creative palette mm. or a very outward focused, strong, creative output to have a very plain studio space. Mm. One color, monochromatic, you know, I'm thinking of one fashion designer and her entire palette was black. Every single thing that she made and created was black or black tones. Hmm. And her studio space and house was all white, cream, and beige. Hmm. And so for her, she needed that like palette cleanser of being at home in the white to go to her studio and her creation and create with black. Huh. That's so interesting. But she's not the only designer that has talked about that. I know that there are other, a quilter that I know says, everything I quilt is with color. It's color saturation. It's how the colors work together. It's very bright, bold color, saturated, really big, bold colors. And she said, in my studio space, I need no color. Okay. So that I can have a clear mind to work with the color as a medium. Okay. Yeah. But it's an interplay of what we're talking about here between silence and noise. Mm hmm. Yeah. I, as I, I was, as I was reading um, her next page, she says, silence is often chock full of energy. So it sounds like those studio people, the, the, those designers, uh -huh. maybe they're 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 drained after a day in color, and they need their their quiet place to um, resurge that energy to um, find her energy again. Um, yeah, well, I keep does coming. Yeah. yeah, I keep coming back to silence is chocked full of energy. And isn't that the truth? I, <laughs> I have experienced that. Yeah. I, I remember, it's, you know, you hear a lot about less is more mm -hmm. that phrase. I, I remember, um, I had a wonderful counselor for a couple of years. And one of the things he said to me that has really stuck with me, he said, um, when you make a decision, don't talk about it, just do it. So I've used that a lot. Like if I decide that I'm going to um, make sure that I let my daughter talk more and interrupt her less. I won't tell her that I'm going to do that. I just try to practice that effort. You know, or if I'm going to make a new dinner, I'll just I'll just do it and present it to my husband and not try to make like it's a big deal. I don't know, those are probably both bad examples, but the concept is good. <laughs> I love that because it allows for me, if I, because I've heard that in different, in different ways. Um, I had a teacher who said that if you want to do something and it's important enough to you, you'll do it. Mm -hmm. And it's the same flavor of what you're talking about. Like, if it's important, you won't make excuses. You will take the personal sacrifice that's required. Like, if you want to read more, you, that means for me, I have to turn the TV off and like, mm -hmm. or like go to a different room and read. And like that takes personal sacrifice. I have to change my habit to do that. And, you know, that whether I talk about it or not, it still requires me to change my mind. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea of not having to explain yourself or your decision or your reason to anybody. Yeah, and I've actually found that if I don't talk about it, then I'm more likely to do it. 
isn't that interesting <laughs> and sort of counter counter um culture to like find an accountability partner <laughs> yeah i guess there are times when i have asked for an accountability partner that i'm sure there's a place for that as a tool so if it works talking about very small scale things um <laughs> And, and I'm and I'm not even thinking of an example right now, but just in general, I, I just remember that effort that I've made in the past of not talking about something. And if I don't talk about it, then I don't have the gratification of someone saying, oh, that sounds like a great idea. I can't wait to see it instead. OK, so I've already gotten some gratification for talking about it. Maybe I don't need to do it. <laughs> But if I don't give myself that gratification, but I just sit down and do it and wait, wait for the gratification of someone noticing it or just enjoy the gratification of, oh, myself, look, you know, just that let, let my own enjoyment of it be enough. You know, it's a different sort of a thing that I, that I have to intentionally do. To me, it sounds like personal integrity. Thank you. <laughs> that you set an intention or make a decision to change and then you yourself show up to do that for yourself. What a kind way to put it, thank you. <laughs> but then like, it does take that outer reward system away completely. That no longer <laughs> exists. Yeah, because you Within, don't always have someone notice. Uh-huh. Right. And that's really hard. <laughs> We're going to celebrate this chapter by doing like a mini version of mm -hmm. her homework. Yep. So the creative assignment is on page 102. And she says, it's a useful exercise. Um, listen to someone else openly attentively and without judgment she suggests doing this for half an hour total um i think we're going to try for two minutes well yeah the whole exercise takes a half hour but we're only listening to each other eight minutes at a time yeah that's that's too long for us yeah yeah we're not gonna do that. <laughs> we're gonna do a mini version of that mini version yeah okay so do you want to try it yes i have a timer we're gonna set the timer for two minutes and linda are you ready i'm ready okay go i tried something this past week that i've never done before it's called writing a pattern for assigned pooling so my friend Barbara and I, we were at the Shenandoah Fiber Festival, which was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we bought yarn, we bought yarn for big projects and small projects. And then toward the end of the day, we saw lots of examples of assigned pooling. And we said, how about if we do this? How about if we just buy one hank of yarn that looks like it might be appropriate for assigned pooling and and then we'll just do a project that only requires one worsted hank, you know, 210 yards, low commitment. And I said, yeah, I think if we just do this, it might work. So I, I sat down and I wrote this little pattern and I made a little mini version to test it. Oh, look at that. That's so good. Oh. <laughs> so you start with one stitch. It's um, knitting on a bias, knitting, where you increase two stitches every other row on either side. And then when it's big enough, you um, increase on one side and decrease on the other. And then you cap it off at the end with a, a bind off and a decrease. Um, so obviously in this shape, my assigned pooling was blue. And I had such fun 
inventing the little stitch and experimenting with what might work and what doesn't work, coming up with trying to solve the different questions that came about as I was actually doing it. It was very fun. I think it's going to be fun to see how this might turn out. Um, I think pink is probably the obvious color to choose for this. So I'll let you know how it turns out. <laughs> Do I have to time myself for the reply? I can time. Or no, it... no, not for the no. reply. Right. Okay. So, right. You're supposed to reply for my. So you and your friend Barbara went to a local fiber festival, regional to where we live, and sounds like you had some fun in seeing the different sights and sounds of the festival. And at the end, you decided to try a partner project in assigned pooling. And assigned pooling is when you have two different colors and two different stitches. And when the yarn changes color, you change your stitch. And so you and Barbara bought yarn to try that together. And it sounds like you created, you invented or created your own pattern and stitch combination. And working with, um, a, well, you, you made a swatch, which was a mock-up of a mini cowl on the bias and your sign pooling color was blue. <laughs> That's a wonderful summary of what I said. <laughs> All right. And now it's your turn. I'm going to give you, I'll time you. Okay. On my little timer. Two minutes. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Start. Okay, so um, the end of September kicks off. Well, the vernal equinox is September 21st, and that means that we're in the season of autumn. And for me, this is the busiest season um, prof professionally and personally. So I feel very stressed about the rest of the year until winter begins on December 21st, which is the winter solstice. And for me, this is a time of harvest. It's a time when all of my hard work for the past nine months is sort of like bearing fruit. It's time to pick all of these things that I've been working on and working towards. And it's also a time for me to tie up loose ends. The Shenandoah Fiber Festival is my favorite fiber festival, and I'm so sad that I missed it this year, but I was taking care of some business, some family stuff um, I had to travel this year. And I know that that trip will bear fruit for me in the future, even though I experienced some disappointment not being able to go to the fiber festival. And you know, it is a lot of, this is a cycle of a lot of fiber festivals. There's a lot of things happening around the country. Everybody's getting excited for sweater weather, including me, <laughs> even though I'm a little sad that the nice weather is leaving us. You know, there's a little nip in the air. I love the autumn. Um, harvesting the flowers, the leaves changing, the the apple picking and all of that. So it's a very special time of year for me. And we're getting ready for the hibernation of winter. Excellent. So the timer went off. I, I realize it's maybe we should give each other like a 15 second warning or something when you do this with your friend. Um, I, don't, I don't know how I could talk for eight minutes about something, honestly. Eight minutes was funny. But so I heard you talk about how when fall comes um, from September 21st to December 21st, it's a stressful time for you in one sense because all the um, fiber festivals come up and um, you also had to deal with some family travel. So there is a lot going on for your business and your personal life. 
and yeah. you have to manage all that well, which is difficult. So you're not really very relaxed, perhaps until the end of that season. Um, I like how you seem to know that well now. You know what's coming up. You yeah. you um, find a way to think about it positively as well as kind of delineate what your challenges are. And um, I applaud you for just being organized with it and being so self-aware that you're um, – well, it sounds like you're very on top of it, even though it's difficult. Um, I'm sorry, too, that you had to miss the Shenandoah Fiber mm -hmm. Festival. It seemed like it um, wasn't as well attended as I thought it might be. Mm -hmm. Nobody else in our guild went except my friend, my friend and I, even though everybody was planning to go. So yeah. I guess perhaps it's a busy season for... Uh, a lot of people, yeah. But um, it sounds mm. like you're right in the middle of it now. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah, we're right in the middle. So I've got more traveling coming up over the next few weeks, and you know, it's just navigating all of the benchmarks. Okay. Yeah. Well, that that was very well done. I enjoyed hearing more about your 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 thoughts on the fall and, and yeah. what challenge it is for you. Um, I think I think it's safe to say that you know if any of you try that exercise, you can just pick the number of minutes mm -hmm. that you want to. Maybe we have to work up to eight minutes. You know, maybe we start maybe. with two or three, and then you can work up to eight minutes um you know i'm thinking of the i don't know if you've seen this movie it's it's called larry crown with tom hanks and julia roberts oh i love those actors i'll have oh, to put that down this movie is just it's dulce it is so sweet and such a fun movie but in the movie one of the one of the key themes is that there's a class about public speaking and <laughs> you know the final exam is this challenge where you have to talk about something for a number of minutes so okay. it's a throwback for me <laughs> that's great i mean one of the things that i came that i thought of when i was reading her chapter was um abraham lincoln's gettysburg address Mm. And one of the famous points about that, if if you go or sometimes if you read about it, is um, let's see what what I do with my book. I wrote down the name of the other guy, the guy who spoke before him. I wrote down his name, um, Edward something. He spoke for two hours, <laughs> and then Abraham Lincoln got up. His speech was two minutes. And it's become one of the best known speeches ever written. I mean, it's a perfect example, I think, of less is more. So good. On that note, how can we how can we close on a better note? That's amazing. So perhaps the today's theme is to look for creativity in the silences. Mm. Enjoy your week. See you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.